Hello everyone, welcome back. We are in the 8th module. Up to 7th module, we have covered gradient based reliability analysis and in this module, we are going to learn simulation based reliability analysis. And the first lecture will be on Monte Carlo simulation. Before we uh, go into the details of Monte Carlo simulation, let us quickly um, review the uh, problem and uh, why we need Monte Carlo simulation. Let us uh, clarify it first. So, we have already solved reliability problem where uh, we first define a limit state and using the definition of the limit state, we developed some model, uh, then we obtained the optimal distance in the standard normal space. And for that, we discussed first order approximation, which is shown here by the blue line and then second order approximations where we consider the curvature at this design point and then improve the estimate of uh, probability of failure or reliability index beta that we obtain. Now the question comes in our mind that how do we verify this result that we obtain from the gradient based reliability analysis. So if we consider an example, the one that we have already solved many times. So, this beam with a point load and this problem is taken from Haldar Mohadevan's book where we design the beam at the support and we first find out the plastic moment capacity and then applied moment based on that we uh, actually solve this problem and here we have two random variables and the properties of these random variables are given here. Then using first order reliability analysis we get a reliability estimate of um, 2.2577 that is beta and then after third iteration we get probability of failure as phi of minus beta which is 1.1984 into 10 to the power minus 2. Automatically the question comes in our mind that this value of beta and pf whether they are correct or not how should we verify. Now for that uh, we have other um, reliability analysis models uh, which actually we use uh, to verify the results. One of them is actually simulation based reliability analysis and that is what uh, the topic of today's discussion. Obviously, if we revisit this problem, we have these two random variables and uh, if we plot their distribution, both of them are normal with uh, mean and sigma standard deviation. So, that is what you can see on your screen. So, uh, these are the two random variables. Um, because of this randomness, uh, we have failure which we have already explained uh, in different ways. And uh, by now you can recall that this common area under the PF is actually what is causing the failure. Now there are ways actually we can simulate the samples of this probability distribution. So given the probability distributions, there are certain ways actually we can draw samples. Now, if we do that and generate some samples, we get a situation like this. So, we have uh, this pink circles, they are different samples drawn from these two PDF. Now, if you see, there are two axes uh, corresponding to the two random variables we have in this analysis. Now, what we do, uh, we simulate samples from this PDF and then plot it. And this blue line you can see actually represents the limit state. Now, obviously, this limit state, it uh, demarcates the regions for failure and safety as you can see in this schematic diagram also. So, you have a region uh, that represents failure and another one is safe. In this case, we have this region on the other side where we have mostly the samples generated. This region is the safe region and you can see there are small samples actually that is on the other side of the limit state and they represent failure. Now, if we can generate samples from the given PDF, then obviously for every sample generation, for example, say this point, if we consider, it has a corresponding FY value and corresponding Z value. So, we can use that value in the limit state equation and check whether it is equal to 0 or greater than 0 or less than 0. 
Depending upon the value of gx, then we can decide whether it is a failure or safe. So that case, as in this case, this point represents a safe uh, generation of points corresponding to f, y, and z. So if we can numerically generate these samples and then test it just by substituting them in the limit state equation, then probably we can um, identify the safe and failure cases. And based on that, we can estimate probability of failure. Now, that's the central idea of Monte Carlo simulation. Obviously, the first question that we need to answer is how to generate samples from a given PDF. But based on this discussion, at least it uh, seems to us that there is a possibility if we can generate numerically some samples from this PDF and then repeat the exercise for all the random variables and then just by substituting those values in the original limit state, there is a way probably we can solve the problem and verify the result that we obtain from first order reliability analysis. So that's a quick overview of Monte Carlo simulation. The next question that we first have to answer is how to draw samples from this PDF. So let us see how we can do that. Now, <clears throat> this topic of sample generations from a given PDF comes under random number generation. Obviously, uh, this itself is a very interesting topic. We will not go into the very much details of random number generations, but at least we will go through the models that we use and how we actually generate the samples, what are the mathematical basis, which logic we follow that we are going to discuss here. And then finally, we will use these random numbers to solve our problem, what we call Monte Carlo simulations. Now, if we consider a sequence uh, that you can see on your screen, so it is 1, 4, 7, 10, 13. Now, this sequence of numbers uh, if I uh, offer you, you can easily tell that there is a certain pattern behind these numbers. And what is that? You know the model. This follows an arithmetic series and the model is on your screen. So we can generate these numbers based on the parameters on the right hand side. So what are the parameters on the right hand side? You have a1, n that corresponds to the number of samples that you generate and then d is another parameter that actually gives us this model. Now in this model, as we keep on changing value of n, then we can generate these series. Now obviously, we can tell what will be the number after 13 from this model. And because we can predict this beforehand, we can certainly tell what will be the number next to 13 and then obviously the next one. and in series, all the numbers, although it is an infinite uh, series, uh, so we can tell all these possibilities beforehand as we keep on changing the value of n, where we keep a1 and d constant, and based on that, we generate numbers. Now, the numbers out of these possibilities, it is not a random number simply because we can certainly tell what will be the outcome corresponding to which n. Now, this series is completely predictable. So now let us consider one more possibilities. So we have another five numbers on your screen. So you can see first one is 29, next one is 38, next is 2, then 32 and 26. Now if you try to find out what is the uh, model like the one we have in uh, this arithmetic series, you will not be able to tell. But still, there is a model that we will see in a minute. But from 1, when we go to the another number, obviously, it does not follow a deterministic model that we have in the previous case. Now, what is the model we use in this case? It is here. So, xn plus 1 will be equal to a times xn plus c mod m. So this is the model what we will use. I will explain that in a minute. But in this case, the numbers that we get comes randomly. And that's why it is called a random set of numbers. 
obviously uh, i will discuss other issues in a minute this is not purely a random number but for the time being let us consider this set as a sequence of random samples now in this model there are certain components as you can see in this model we have a xn then c then obviously this m so what are they a is the multiplier c is the increment when n equal to 0, that means when we start the sequence, that x0 is called seed. If we change seed, we can generate different sequence. And m is the modulus. Obviously, they have certain range, which you can see on your screen. And if we start this sequence with the initial seed and fixing the values of a, c, and m, then we can generate this type of sequence. Now, in this case, when we simulate these set of numbers we used a equal to 15 c equal to 2 m equal to 57 and x naught that is the seed is 17. now how do we do that i will explain that in a minute but this uh, model is called linear congruential generator so this is a random number generator model which is linear. Why linear? Because you can see the equation xn plus 1 equal to a times xn plus c. That is the equation of a straight line. So, it is a linear relation, linear equation. Why congruential? That I will explain in a minute. So, we use a linear model to generate random numbers and of course, there is uh, some congruence between the seed and the next number generated because of this uh, modulus operator that we will see in a minute. So, if we start the sequence just like we did using x0 equal to 17, so our seed is 17, then the next number x1 will be a is 15, so 15 times 17 plus our increment is 2 and then mod 57. Now, if you just find out this number, it is 257 mod 57. Now, after we apply this mod, that means we divide this 257 by 57, then there will be a reminder. So, that reminder is 29. So, that is how we get the first number and then we again repeat the uh, process. So, for the second one, x2 will be 15 times the one we have already generated. So, for the x2, that is the seed plus 2 and then we take the modulus using m as 57. So, in this case we have 437 mod 57. So, the number comes uh, out to be 38. So, that is how we generate this number. Now, obviously when we say uh, two numbers which are congruence, what we mean? Now, if you check uh, what we do, we divide, say, this 437, we divide it by 57. So, when we divide one uh, number with another, obviously, we have a quotient and a reminder. So, what we do, we consider this R reminder as the uh, next number in the sequence. So, if we say A is uh, congruent with B, uh, using this mod operation that means a minus b can be divided by this m and that is how we have actually generated this number because uh, we constructed in such a way that the remainder is actually the next number. So, if we have say 257, if we uh, subtract 29 from 257, obviously that will be divisible by 57. So, that is the reason this is called a congruential generator. Now, as I said, this is not purely a random number because uh, if you repeat this uh, after a certain stage, it will repeat itself. There is a period and of course, there is also a model uh, here just like we had another model, a deterministic model in the previous case. Um, that is the reason uh, we get some numbers which are, which seems to be uh, random numbers, but they are not purely random numbers. Now, 
Uh, this uh, model was developed uh, sometimes in uh, 1952 to 54 and then after that lot of uh, improvement of this model has come and there are other options for random number generators. But this model gives a very nice idea how these random numbers are generated which has uh, equal uh, probability. Now uh, let us see what other uh, models are there. For example, when we generate uh, normal random numbers, there is a very popular model called Box-Muller algorithm and that develops actually uh, a sequence of number using uh, uniform sequence. So if we have a uniform sequence, say u1, u2 up to un, then we can generate a sequence of x1, x2 up to xn and this uh, sequence will follow normal uh, distribution. Obviously, the CDF corresponding to X is capital FX of X. So, how do we do that? Again, in this case, samples of X is nothing but FX inverse of U. Why that is the case? I will show a schematic diagram in a minute and then that will uh, make it further clear. So, in this case, what we do? We again equate the probability in two uh, sequence. So, we have a sequence of x and another of u and then we equate this probability and then from this we extract this relation and thereby we actually take the inverse of fx which is not reciprocal by the way and that is how we develop the samples of x from the samples of u. So, now imagine if capital fx is phi of x. Then what will happen? If we apply this model, then we will get a sequence of x which will follow normal distribution. Now, we know the expression for normal distribution that you can see on your screen. This x is having 0 mean and unit standard deviation obviously. And the Box-Muller model tells us that we can generate a bivariate sequence of say Z1 and Z2 following normal distribution with zero mean and unit standard deviation from a bivariate uniform sequence U1, U2 having uh, limits 0 to 1. So, what is that Box-Muller model? Now, you can see on your screen. So, we have Z1, Z2 which is uh, related to the sequence of U1, U2. Now, u1 and u2 are following uniform distributions with limits 0 to 1 and then if we use this model we will get z1, z2 which will follow normal distribution with mean 0 and unit standard deviation. So, how can we graphically uh, show this? So, this is the uniform uh, PDF from 0 to 1 as you can see it has constant value of uh, PDF over the domain and then the CDF you can see here it is a straight line starting from 0 and reaching 1 because ultimately the area under this curve has to be 1. So that is the uniform PDF and CDF. So this is the normal PDF where it is a bell shaped curve having mean at 0 and in this case we have unit standard deviation. Now if you plot the CDF it will have a shape like this. Again, it will start from 0 and ultimately it will reach to 1. And now, if you notice that the domain of PDF for uniform distribution is between 0 to 1 and by the definition of CDF, the CDF also ranges from 0 to 1. Now, what we can do, we can actually, let me, let me rotate this because in the CDF plot of uniform distribution on the y axis you have again a range of 0 to 1. So, if we just rotate this and then now I just rotate the plot. So, what we have the samples of u will range from 0 to 1 and also the CDF of the same distribution it also ranges from 0 to 1. Now, if we draw a sample for this uniform distribution, 
it will have a corresponding CDF and just by mapping the CDF we can find out the estimate of Z. So that's the sequence we follow in this model. So that's how uh, we generate the sequence of U and then we convert that to Z. So now to prove that uh, we use uh, polar coordinates. So let us represent Z1 as R cos theta and Z2 as R sin theta. And this theta uh, obviously it is uniform between uh, the limits 0 to 2 pi. Then if we find out what is the probability that R will be less than or equal to small r is that we can uh, write in this uh, uh, double integral. So 1 by 2 pi the range of this is because of this uh, polar representation we have x square plus y square less than equal to r square and then exponential of minus x square plus y square divided by 2 uh, times dx dy. Now in this case obviously the mean is 0 and standard deviation is 1 that uh, we will see uh, whether we get this ultimately that expression that proposed by Box and Muller in a minute. So, if we carry out this uh, double integral, uh, we apply the appropriate limits of the two integrals and then we simplify where we consider x square plus y square equal to s square. And then after simplification, we get ultimately this expression 1 minus exponential of minus r square by 2. So, if we continue our discussion, so we started with uh, the polar representation of z1 and z2. And then now we have this uh, uh, probability of r less than or equal to r is obtained from this expression. Now obviously u will be 1 minus exponential of r square by 2 and that leads to r equal to square root of minus 2 log 1 minus u. This if you modify you can represent this r in this format the only logic is if u is uniformly distributed between 0 to 1 then 1 minus u is also uniform under the same limit that's the reason we can modify this and represent r in this compact form in terms of u then what we have we have theta equal to obviously 2 pi u1 and then r we have obtained square root of minus 2 log u2. Then we have the first expression x equal to z1. z1 is r cos theta. So if we put the expressions we get this first model and similarly we can also find out y which is uh, this will be z2. So z2 will be equal to again square root of minus 2 log u2 sine of 2 pi u1. So that is what proposed by Box and Muller and this clearly shows that uh, Z1, Z2 follows normal distribution because that is how we constructed this uh, expression. You can see here uh, normal it is and with 0 mean and unit standard deviation obviously there is no correlation. So what we get from this model is that if we can simulate the samples of U1 and U2 then using this relation we can convert them into Z1, Z2. So that is the samples of u1 and u2 generated and when we use this sequence of u1 and u2 in this model then we can simulate the samples of z1 and z2 that is what you can see on your screen. Now that is how the box muller algorithm works. So there are different ways other models for random number generation. Now, we normally use say MATLAB, then in MATLAB there are inbuilt options for random number generations. Uh, we will not go into the details of that because our objective is not to study how the random number generators works, but just to get an impression that how these numbers are generated and then it is used for Monte Carlo simulation to solve the reliability problem so that we can verify the results that we obtained from our previous analysis. Now, obviously, the models that we have just discussed, they uh, use one marginal distribution and from that we can draw samples. 
So we first generate say uniform random numbers and that uniform random numbers we can convert into any other distributions that we have. It may be log normal, it may be um, extreme value distributions or any other distributions that we can easily generate from the samples of uniform random numbers. Now in our reliability problem we have other issues where we have two random variables which are correlated. Now if you have a correlated case and how do we use that in our reliability analysis that we have already discussed in our first order reliability models. So if we have a correlated sequence then what we do we introduce a transformation which you can see on your screen x equal to vy. Then what we do we find out this v matrix which is uh, the eigenvectors and then using this eigenvector we can uncorrelate the sequence that we start with. Now these models we have already discussed so we can find out the mean and variance of the new distribution y so that you can see on your screen. So this is the mean value of y that we obtain from the mean value of x using this transformation v. Then we can find out this CY matrix using this uh, expression and these are the lambdas, lambda 1, lambda 2 up to lambda n depending upon the number of variables we have in this vector representation. So this lambdas are eigenvalues of the CX matrix. So this is how we actually uncouple a set of random variables and then we use this uncoupled y variables in further estimation of uh, first order reliability analysis. Now the same way we can actually simulate a correlated sequence from the uncorrelated sequence. So in this case what we have, we have n uncorrelated random variables that is x. It has a mean vector mu x and a covariance matrix cx. Now if we have a set of random variables u which are independent and strictly diagonal covariance that is cu. Then what we can do, we can generate samples of x from the samples of u and what is the transformation? This is x equal to a transpose u. This is exactly similar to what we did earlier. And then in this case, Cx is a positive definite and symmetric matrix. And then uh, this orthogonal transformation has this property. This uh, is known to us. We have already solved this case. And then we can find out the covariance matrix Cu just like in case of Cy we did earlier. Then what we do? We can represent this Cx matrix in this new format. And then the elements of this C matrix will have this representation where this delta jk is the Kronecker delta. So if we continue, so we wish to generate the samples of x from the samples of u. And uh, we can also go for normalizations. So we subtract the mean, obviously we'll get this model. And then the samples of uh, x with zero mean will have this similar transformation. And then we generate the samples of y. And then with that, actually we can generate the samples of x. So now this Cx matrix, we can represent in this format and which we can reduce it to because if this Cu having all uh, leading diagonals 1 then Cx matrix becomes B times B transpose or A transpose times A whichever way we represent then this B is a lower triangular matrix. So we'll see in a minute how this helps us actually to generate the samples 
So let us consider a uh, 3 cross 3 matrix. So we have on the left hand side this fully populated matrix of sigmas. And then on the right hand side we have the first matrix which is a lower triangular matrix and the right one is a upper triangular matrix which is the inverse of this lower triangular matrix. Just we have this B times B transpose. Now from this relation you can easily represent sigma 1 1 is nothing but B 1 1 square. Similarly, you can also obtain the expression for sigma 2 2 in terms of B 2 1 and B 2 2. And then finally, sigma 3 3 will have this expression. So, if we just uh, generalize them, all sigma i i will be having this relation where this k parameter, this is less than i. So, using this relation, we can generate all sigma i i in terms of B i uh, k. Then for the cross terms, if we repeat the same exercise, we have sigma 2 1 equal to 1 2 and that will be equal to B 2 1 times B 1 1. Similarly, we can also represent other cross terms in the sigma matrix in terms of this lower and upper triangular matrix. Then there also a generalization is possible. So for any given uh, matrix dimension, we can represent the cross term sigma ij using this relation where uh, we have two secondary parameters j and k corresponding to the different elements. Now this is how we represent this sigma, the left hand side uh, in terms of the lower and upper triangular matrix. We can also uh, represent the elements of this lower and upper triangular matrix in terms of sigma. It is very simple. So from the first relation we get B11 is square root of sigma 11. Then uh, we can find out B22 from this relation because uh, this relation tells us how this B22 is related to sigma 11, 22 and 21. That is the elements of this sigma matrix. Then we can find out B21, B32 and then finally we can generalize. So the elements of this lower and upper triangular matrix will be given here. So Bij will have this expression. So from this relation what we can do, we can easily find out from the elements of this sigma ij, we can find out all this Bij. So any given matrix we can find out the corresponding lower triangular matrix and upper triangular matrix. The question is how this helps us uh, to generate the sample. So let us take an example. So we have two variables x1 and x2. They are correlated and they are following normal distributions. Their means are 10 and 12. And the covariance matrix you can see on your screen. So this is the covariance matrix between these two variables. What we wish to do, we have to generate the samples of x1 and x2. So what we do first, we find out the lower triangular matrix and upper triangular matrix for this Cx. So we use that relation we have just developed and then find out the elements of B matrix. So the B11 is here, 2, 1 you can see on your screen that is 2 and then 1, 2 which is 0 in this case. So that constitutes and then finally B2, 2 that constitutes B matrix. So the lower triangular matrix you can see on your screen. Now once we have this, we can write down the expression for x1 and x2. So that's the relation between x1, x2 with y1 and y2. So what we'll do, we'll simulate the samples of y1 and y2 and using this relation, we'll generate samples of x1 and x2. So let us then simulate the sample. So this is y1 and y2 you can see on your screen. And for every outcome of this simulation that you can see this small circles, each circle represents one outcome that is having a sequence of y1 and y2. And then for every set of y1 and y2, we can use this relation to find out x1 and x2. See the first equation, obviously the way we construct this model, 
the first equation between x1 and y1 it is having no influence of y2 but in the next equation the moment we have uh, the samples of y1 and y2 and we try to simulate x2 we consider both of them so obviously that's how this x1 and x2 is uh, correlated and if we just plot the samples so corresponding to this value we have a set of x1 and x2 and just by looking at the samples you can see obviously there is a correlation so it is following a pattern so that's how we can simulate samples of y1 and y2 which are uncorrelated just by looking at the samples and their distributions you can easily uh, conclude that there is no correlation but the pattern in the x1 and x2 shows there is a possible correlation in fact we can verify whether the simulated samples of x2 and x1 and x2 they have the same correlation from where we started that is represented here this will check as we solve other problems but this is quite possible because we have the samples of uh, x1 and x2 so from these two uh, expressions the moment we have samples of x1 and x2 we can find out the correlation and that we can verify with this uh, uh, CX matrix where the correlation between x1 and x2 is already embedded so that uh, is not a um, difficult task okay so a different example in this case we have x1 x2 x3 but out of these uh, three random variables only x1 and x2 are correlated and the covariance matrix you can see on your screen so in this case again we have to find out the elements of b matrix that is the lower triangular matrix so that's what you can see on your screen so i'm not going into the details of uh, this element evaluation that i believe you can uh, follow the uh, notations and then uh, repeat the exercise what we did in the previous case and then find out the elements of B matrix which is shown here. Now once we have it we can represent x1, x2, x3 in terms of y1, y2, y3. Interestingly in this case you see the third variable x3 is only related to y3 and it does not depend on y1 and y2. While uh, we, we use the relation this b matrix which is lower triangular matrix obviously x1 is related to y1 the moment we simulate the samples x2 it is having the influence from y1 and y2 so our next task is simulate the samples of y1 y2 and y3 and then use them in this relation to find out the samples of x1 x2 x3 so let us plot y1 and y2 because we are for the timing not interested about y3 and x3 because that is uncorrelated so we have the samples of y1 and y2 and again in this case you see the samples of y1 and y2 they are uncorrelated so just by looking at the uh, samples you can easily expect that there is no correlation but the moment you look at the x1 and x2 samples there is a pattern so there is a correlation between x1 and x2 that is reflected in this CX matrix. So that's how we actually simulate samples of random variables. Now in this case we use normal random variables but we can consider any other distributions and then we can simulate samples. In fact uh, we have already discussed two important models one is Rosenblatt transformation another is Natov transformation so if we just quickly revisit the Rosenblatt transformation there uh, we have this is the model so what we do in this model again for any given marginal first we map it with u1 u2 uk and then you see these uh, u1, u2, uk are again mapped to z1, z2 and zk where this capital phi represents the standard normal distribution. So the moment we have this relation now you can see how this uh, logic of Rosenberg transformation is uh, built up. So we can simulate the samples of uh, z 
and then uh, convert that to find out the samples x. So the sequence is we first generate samples of u1, u2 up to uk. Then we can use that to find out this z1, z2, zk that we have already studied and using this relation then finally we can get the samples of x1, x2 up to xk. Obviously in this model we use conditional probability and we have already solved this for reliability analysis so you by now know how to actually solve this problem. So that's the uh, PDF and CDF of z which is uh, in this case standard normal. So and this is the model we used to simulate the samples of either z1, z2 up to zk or um, x1, x2, xk which way we actually construct the model. <laughs> So this is an example that we earlier solved. So we have a joint distribution between uh, two random variables x1 and x2 and then we had a limit state equation. Then using Rosenblatt we already solved this. So these are the marginals and then uh, we can develop the Rosenblatt transformation. So you can see on your screen these are the two expressions for phi of z1 and phi of z2 using Rosenblatt transformation and that we again solve. So this is the PDF and CDF of the marginals. In this case, the type of marginals are same. Only the parameters, this A and B parameters changed. That's the reason you have only one plot for this PDF and CDF. But this model clearly tells us how we can simulate the samples of Z1, Z2 and then ultimately we can get the samples of x1 and x2. So <coughs> that's the expression of uh, z1, z2 in this case. And then uh, the right hand side again is completely known and then we can simulate the samples of z1, z2 or if we simulate the samples of z1, z2 we can actually go to the x domain where we have samples of x1 and x2. So this is again a simulation that we studied earlier. So in this case also there is a uh, match between x domain and z domain. So for every possible simulations in x domain we have a corresponding point in the z domain. So that's what is shown here. And then we can use these samples further for our reliability analysis. So earlier we used this model for uh, first order reliability analysis and then we can use these samples and then using these samples we can solve Monte Carlo simulations. Now again we also uh, discussed this uh, paper, this is a very interesting paper and by now I, I assume that all of you have gone through this paper and have studied well uh, the relations between Rosenblatt transformation and Natoff model. In case of Natoff transformation, so that is the model that we have uh, solved many times. So again quickly consider an example. So in this case we have x1, x2. One is following marginally normal, another is log normal. So the first variable is log normal with sample mean sample standard deviation given which is 5 and 2 and the second variable following normal distribution with sample mean 6 and sample standard deviation 1.25. And the correlation coefficient in this case is 0.15. So uh, we have simulated the samples x1 and x2 and then uh, corresponding z1, z2 either way today we have discussed how to sample this standard normal distributions uh, and then we can convert uh, one to other and then find out the samples of x1, x2 and vice versa. So that gives us a clear idea how we can simulate samples so we started with the concept of random number generations and then uh, the moment we generate say uniform random numbers that we can convert into other random variables and we can simulate the samples of other distributions. That is the case for univariate problem. So we have a single uh, random variable and for that we can draw samples but in reliability case we have correlated random variables. So the moment we have correlated random variables, we first uncouple them and then 
uh, we simulate the samples of uncoupled random variables and then we can convert it back to the original domain. Then finally, we have this model, Nataf or Rosenblatt, where we consider the joint distribution and then we also again correlate uh, one uh, domain with another and then uh, there is a one-to-one -one relation between these two domains. For every sample in say x domain, we have a sample in z domain and vice versa and that's how we can simulate the samples. So this is all about uh, random number generations. As I said, this topic itself is very interesting and very uh, well developed, but we are not going into the details of the complexities and different models, how we can uh, more accurately simulate random numbers. But for the time being, the concept that we have uh, is extremely helpful for verifying the results that we get uh, from our gradient-based reliability analysis. And that's precisely what we do in Monte Carlo simulations. So what we do, we actually use the classical definition of probability. So if you recall, in the classical definition, if we take the example of tossing a coin, what we do, we carry out the test. Of course, uh, there are events and outcomes. This all we discussed at the very beginning. And then it has to be exhaustive. So we have out of n trials, small n a is favorable to the event A. And then we can find out probability of A, which is the ratio of small n a and capital N. Of course, we had a question how big this capital N should be because in case of tossing a coin, we know what are the possibilities and we know how many trials you have to do. But in case of a general random variable, we do not know what should be the exact number of n. That we'll see how we can estimate this as we progress in this uh, course. But for the time being, what we can conclude is that if we can conduct a sufficiently large number of trials, then using this model, we can find out the probability corresponding to a event A. So with that classical definition, we can now extend it for our reliability based design. So in that case, what we consider this event A correspond to a failure case when we consider a limit state. So if we define the Monte Carlo simulation problem, we have a limit state gx equal to 0, where x is the vector random variable. It may be correlated, it may be uncorrelated, and the different random variables in this uh, capital X can follow normal or any other distribution. We can generate the samples of X, then for every possible set, we can substitute that value in this limit state equation. Then we can solve this limit state and check the value whether it is equal to 0, greater than 0 or less than 0. If it is greater than 0, obviously that is a safe case. So for the timing, our main aim is to find out probability of failure. That means how many times this gx fails. So we define an indicator function i in such a way that we store the number of failure cases. So this gx for different samples of x, if it is less than or equal to 0, that means it is a failure. And in that case, the indicator function is 1. So it counts the number of failures we have while it ignores if we have a success. That means gx is greater than 0. Now once we do that, then we can use this relation following classical definition. So 1 by capital N, this capital N is the number of trials that we conduct to solve this reliability problem. And then uh, summation of j equal to 1 to n i g x i less than equal to 0. So this i indicator function will have 1. So we sum up all this 1. So we get how many times it has failed. That means this small n a corresponding to event a. And then that we divide by capital N to find out probability of failure. 
obviously the question comes in our mind that how to select this capital N. So obviously we'll try to uh, answer that question in a minute but for the time being uh, the logic for this Monte Carlo simulations to verify the reliability that we already have estimated using gradient based method the logic is simple that we have to simulate the samples of x then we have to check whether this indicator function is 1 or 0 and then next task is to estimate the statistics of this indicator function because using that we can then develop some model to have some idea what should be the range of this capital N that will give us a proper estimate of probability of failure because otherwise if we start with a small number of sets the results that we get from this analysis will not be accurate that we will see in a minute and as we increase the size we will see our result will also converge to the true value of the probability of failure. So for that what we do we define a new variable j which actually represents the outcome of the trial using different values of n and then uh, we apply central limit theorem and this is uh, already discussed. So it states that the distribution of j that is an estimate uh, given by the sum of the independent sample functions approaches the normal distribution as n tends to infinity. Right. So then what we have this is the pf and obviously just by looking at this expression you can conclude that this expected value of j is nothing but 1 by n summation of this. So, pf is actually the mean estimate of j. Similarly, we can also find out the standard deviation of this new random variable j and that you can see it is very easy 1 by n square summation of variance of i g less than 0. This comes from the variance algebra that we discussed at the very beginning. Then uh, from this relation what we can see sigma j square that is the estimate of probability of failure is having a variance of sigma j and this standard deviation of j it directly varies with standard deviation of i and inversely with n to the power half. This clearly indicates that as we increase the number of samples in capital N, obviously what will happen, this sigma j will keep on reducing. That means the moment sigma j goes to 0, we have a perfect estimate of this probability of failure. <coughs> so, the variance of this indicator function you can see on your screen. So, this is the variance. Now, obviously, we have uh, this multiple integrals in the continuous form. If we write that in a discrete form, uh, you can see this is the estimate using the discrete form and 1 by n minus 1. Now, you can easily appreciate this comes from the unbiased estimation for sigma i. And this part obviously is mean of j. So, uh, now, if you can recall, we also uh, discussed the confidence interval and the confidence interval has a structure like this, you can see on your screen and for normal distribution, this k equal to 1.96 covers the 95 percent confidence interval that also we have discussed. So, that is the graphical representation. So, as we keep on changing that k or z whichever we call it. So, these two vertical lines you can see on your screen that tells us the confidence interval. So, in this case if we consider 95 percent. So, in that case the values of z or k is plus minus 1.96. Now, 
if we go back to our indicator function, an indicator function i has two possibilities, either 1 or 0, depending upon the success or failure. Now, when we have a random variable with two possibilities, that means we are dealing with a Bernoulli trial. Our design problem is exactly the same. In a design case, in the first instance, we can have a successful design. If it is not, then obviously, we have to repeat the design procedure and change the variables so that we get a success. So, a design problem has two possibilities, either success or failure. That is also reflected in the indicator function. Now, the new random variable j that we have defined is actually following binomial distributions because when you repeat the Bernoulli trial again and again, we get a binomial distribution. This is what we again discussed at the very beginning in the first module. And the mean of j is capital NP because it is following binomial distribution and sigma j is NPQ to the power half, where Q is nothing but 1 minus P. So, if we model P as my failure, then Q corresponds to success. And therefore, in this case, the confidence interval, again, you can see on your screen. Now, if we divide these expressions, we have this uh, by NP. So, we can actually further uh, modify this expression, first expression in, into the second one. And then, if you look at this expression at the middle, this is nothing but the estimate of error. So, this epsilon, it is the error in estimating PF, which is defined by the random variable J. And for that, we have the error estimates and that we can correlate with the number of samples capital N. So, that is how if we have uh, Monte Carlo simulations, then the left hand side we have the error in the estimation of P that we can set how much or what is the amount of error that we will consider ok in our analysis. Say we consider 1 percent error in estimation of PF or 2 percent, 3 percent. Like that we can set this error on the left hand side. Then uh, the moment we know uh, the confidence interval, we can set this k and we know the probability p and then from that we can actually estimate this capital N. Obviously, not all the cases we have a clear idea about uh, this small p, which is true, but uh, normally Monte Carlo simulation we use uh, along with say first order reliability method. So, from first order reliability method, we can have a good estimate of P and that P we can use here to get an idea what should be the capital N in case of Monte Carlo simulation. So, that is how we actually come to conclude what should be the capital N when we start the Monte Carlo simulation. So, let us take an example. In this case, we have a probability of failure which is 10 e minus 3 and we consider uh, error of 10 percent which is okay for us with a confidence interval of 95 percent. So, in that case, if you use this expression, we know everything except this capital N. So, we have set this epsilon to be 10 percent. We know k value corresponding to 95 percent confidence interval and then p f which is p in this case. So, we know it is 10 into uh, e minus 3. So, then uh, if we solve, just put those values and find out what should be the value of n if we try to simulate this probability of failure using Monte Carlo simulation. Now, here is a plot. On the vertical axis, we have the number of samples and then horizontal axis correspond to the amount of error that we can consider. Now, as you can see, if we go for small amount of error, that should be the case, then obviously for that we need large number of samples to estimate this probability of failure accurately. 
this is also I mean uh, intuitively we can conclude that for small amount of error obviously we need to uh, spend more computational energy to get a accurate value so this is one of the major trouble we have in Monte Carlo simulation because we need large number of samples to simulate uh, probability of failure normally in our case probability of failure is very low because uh, we should have a design where the reliability value is very high that's the reason corresponding probability of failure is low and for the so low failure probability if we try to simulate with a uh, less amount of error obviously we need to go for really large number of samples now with that let us uh, solve some example so in this case again we have a cantilever beam this beam is having a point load at the free end and the limit state is based on the serviceability limits so we have a allowable deflection of L by 325 at the free end and the moment we apply a load obviously it undergoes some deformation so our limit state in this case is the difference between the allowable and the applied deformation in this problem we have three random variables p l and e and the corresponding mean and standard deviation you can see on your screen and moment of inertia i it is a deterministic variable and its value is given so all these random variables they are following normal distribution so if you plot this random variables you can see on your screen so they are following uh, normal distribution so you can see the pdf and corresponding cdf for all three random variables then we have solved this problem using form and sum so the results from form and sum you can see on your screen so the beta corresponding to form is 3.0792 which in second order reliability model is further improved and the beta in these cases 3.0959 so our main task is to check whether this beta or pf whichever way we look at the problem whether they are correct or not and that is verified using Monte Carlo simulation so what we do we generate samples of the random variable using random number generator that we have discussed and then for every set we actually find out the indicator function and before that we can have a quick look on the number of capital N that means the number of samples we have to generate in the Monte Carlo simulation for that again we use this model we know PF we set some error and then for that if you use 95 percent confidence limit we can estimate the number of samples so we normally take more samples than we estimate from this and then we initiate the Monte Carlo simulation so what we do again we simulate the samples we have three random variables so we simulate the samples of three random variables and then for one sequence we verify the indicator function we check whether it is one or zero corresponding to failure or success and then finally we use uh, classical definition of probability to find out probability of failure so now here you can see we start with a very small number we gradually increase the number of samples and the results from first order reliability method and the one we get from MCS is now uh, on your screen and the error also you can see as we increase the number of samples we have less and less amount of error so if we go back to this uh, Brighton result it is 9.8122 e 10 to the power minus 4 and the moment we solve the same problem you can see the final results from the Monte Carlo analysis is very close to the probability of failure that we get from Brighton's model 
So that's how we conclude that the estimate obtained from the Brighton's model is accurate because we verify that using Monte Carlo simulation where we numerically simulate the uncertain environment and we define an indicator function and through that indicator function we find out the probability of failure. The moment we get probability of failure we can find out beta because pf is equal to phi of minus beta so we can estimate the beta and that also we can verify. So there is a second problem this problem we have solved multiple times so the same cantilever beam with a point load at the free end and then uh, we consider the support moment for our design and the properties of random variables in this case we have two random variables f y and z and the properties are given here that you can see now in this case z is following normal distribution while f y is following log normal distributions and the distributions you can see then what we do this is how we develop the model and finally using form and sum we get the results that you can see on your screen so the pf in this case 1.976 e tenth minus 7 from brightung's model now what we do we simulate the samples again first we find out what should be the expected number of capital n so that we can do using this model we have just now discussed then we simulate the samples and that you can see on your screen so we simulate samples and then uh, we solve the problem here also as we increase the number of samples then we gradually improve the amount of error we have in our pf estimate and finally you can see the results we get with 2.7 percent error is very close to what we got from Brighton's model. So this again uh, tells us how we can uh, improve uh, the results, the estimate of PF when we go for Monte Carlo simulation and ultimately once we have the error well within acceptable limit that we can use to verify the results. This is a third example design of a concrete beam. So in this case we have three random variables m, x, u and f, s, c. This problem also we solved earlier and there we converted the limit state g x into g z and then we solved it using Brightung's model and first order reliability model. So Brightung's estimate gives 9.3127 into 10 to the power minus 6. So that's the most accurate uh, estimation of probability of failure using gradient based approach and let us see uh, in this case again we first find out the number of samples we need for Monte Carlo simulation and then we simulate the case we have the samples for different random variables and then finally we use them to simulate the case and estimate the indicator function and based on that we define probability of failure and here also you can see as we increase the number of samples our error estimate reduces as obvious we have already discussed the reason why the standard deviation of this indicator function reduces as we increase the number of samples and once that is actually uh, reduced ultimately the estimate of pf is more accurate and that's what you can see on your screen So that's how we can apply numerical technique using Monte Carlo simulations to solve the reliability problem. Here the main challenge is to generate the random numbers where the variables may be uncorrelated, may be correlated, they may be normal, they may be non-normal. Depending upon the situation we have difficulties to simulate them but it is quite possible we have different models to simulate samples of random numbers. We can convert one set of random numbers into another set of random numbers following other distributions and that's how uh, we numerically simulate the uncertain environment and then using those numerical simulations 
we check whether the results we obtain from the gx whether it is less than 0 equal to 0 or greater than 0 and then uh, we define an indicator function and using that indicator function we have adopt classical definition of probability to find out the probability of failure and the moment we have probability of failure we can find out reliability index and this uh, is a very useful tool it is uh, very helpful to verify the results that we have from any other analysis and uh, we can also see the accuracy but the only trouble is here in this case we have to solve for large number of samples normally if the probability of failure is low we need large number of samples to simulate that low failure probability and at times the computational cost is so high that it is very difficult to employ Monte Carlo simulations for large scale problems. So we will see as we progress how we can improve this numerical simulation. Nevertheless, this is a very powerful tool and this is the probably the best way to verify the results because ultimately if we can solve a problem using Monte Carlo simulation that offers the most reliable uh, estimate and that also verifies the results from other models. That's why it is so important, it is so popular and it is so useful in reliability analysis. So we have the last problem in this case again we have a linear limit state but in this case we have a covariance between x1 and x2. So we have the estimates of beta on your screen and in this case the correlation coefficient you can see uh, it is 0.2915 and this problem we again simulate using Monte Carlo simulation. So we generate samples for x1 and x2. Then from these samples we actually can verify whether the correlation between x1 and x2 is properly simulated or not. So you can see the simulated correlation coefficient in this case is 0.29. So it matches well with the original value of 0.2915. Of course we can improve it further if we simulate more samples and that's what I said. The more we reduce the error, uh, the more we need the sample size. And that's how the cost of computation goes high. But in this case, at least up to the two decimal place, we have accurate estimation of uh, correlation coefficient. And then uh, using these simulated samples, again, we can solve the reliability problem. And then we can see in this case also, as we increase the number of samples, our error estimate of probability of failure reduces and ultimately we have in this case less than 1% error. So this value is uh, very close to previous estimate uh, that we did from other model. And because this is a linear uh, limit state, in this case, first order result is very accurate. We don't need to go for curvature corrections using higher order models. So you can see here uh, the, how the results are verified using Monte Carlo simulation. And in this case, we have also verified the correlation coefficient between the simulated samples. So this covers the Monte Carlo simulations for reliability analysis, how we can uh, use this for uh, our problems and then we can verify the results obtained from gradient-based reliability analysis. With that, let us close our discussion here on Monte Carlo simulations. In the next class, we will continue on simulation-based reliability analysis. Thank you.